So um, I, I am an early career researcher in uh, ancient Greek philosophy, and uh, I work on uh, women philosophers in Greek antiquity. So for the purpose of this talk, as Professor Waite mentioned, uh, I'm going to focus on uh, a specific group of women philosophers, the Pythagorean women, and a specific woman philosopher uh, who, whose name is Perictione, and who is credited with writing a philosophical and metaphysical treatise uh, titled On Wisdom. So uh, when uh, Professor Hagen Gruber first invited me to this conference, she mentioned that the event would have covered several fields uh, from the history of philosophy to economics, technology and environmental studies, which I thought was fascinating. And even though I sort of belong to the first group, the historian of philosophy, philosophy I started thinking about oh, an ancient woman philosophers who somehow would cover these fields. And I came across Perictione. So uh, Perictione writes about the relationship between philosophy and the sciences. However, unfortunately, uh, in Perictione's view, it seems to me that the relationship is a bit more uh, competitive and not as collaborative as we wanted it to be. So philosophy is described as superior to the sciences. However, what interests me about this treatise is the way it answers the questions, what did women philosophers philosophized about in Greek? Katerina? Yeah. I have to tell you that sometimes your micro is going back and forth. Okay. So please ensure that your micro... Is this at all better? We hope so. Oh, that it be because now we have such a fore and back and so on. Is yeah. it better? Maybe. No, make it yeah. as loud as possible. Yes, yes, yes. We try yes. it. Good. Okay, sorry about that. Um, thank you. Uh, good. So uh, what, what I was saying is that what fascinates me about this treatise is, is the way it answers the questions, what did women philosophers philosophize about in Greek antiquity? Uh, and this is because the traditional picture of the Pythagorean female sage uh, is that of an expert of the household, or someone who philosophizes about the domestic sphere, the husband-wife relationship and family life. Uh, but what I hope to show with my talk is that ancient women philosophers in general, and the Pythagorean women specifically, were well-rounded thinkers, um, speculating about a much wider variety of topics, which includes, but is not restricted to domestic life, and um, ranges all the way to topics such as how does philosophy, to questions such as how does philosophy relate to science. Okay, so I start with a, a brief uh, introduction uh, to the Pythagorean women for those of you who are not familiar with. Another interruption, okay. Yeah. We keep losing your mic because okay. you're moving physically. You need to sit still <laughs> so that the mic doesn't keep dragging on you or whatever is causing the interruption in okay. the, in the uh, <laughs> transmission of the sound. And then we beg to speak a little slower. Thank you. Yes. Okay, so hopefully it will work. Um, so I just want to start with a brief introduction to the Pythagorean women and, and then move on to the analysis of uh, Perictione's treatise and conclude with some uh, speculations, considerations about what this treatise can tell us uh, about women's philosophical potential. So the Pythagorean women are a group of female philosophers who were followers of Pythagoras in the fifth century BCE and from the Hellenistic period onwards were credited with writings a series of letters and treatises, philosophical letters and treatises. Uh, therefore, the Pythagorean women have long attracted the attention of scholars working on women in the history of philosophy, primarily for two reasons. First of all, um, the Pythagorean women are considered the first documented case of female engagement with ancient Greek philosophy. And here I am stressing two terms. I am stressing documented and, and I am stressing Greek. Uh, so that of the Pythagorean women is the case we have more evidence for, uh, which doesn't mean that they were the only women philosophers in Greek antiquity, nor that they were the first ones. We just have a bit more material from them. And then I want to stress Greek because as Professor Waite mentioned on Sunday, the picture is rather different when we turn to Western and uh, non-Western philosophy, non-Greek philosophical traditions. We have more women, we have more texts. 
So I am focusing for the purpose of this talk on Greek philosophy. And then the second reason why scholars are interested in the Pythagorean women is that they, um, the texts that are ascribed to these figures uh, are the first example of philosophical prose ascribed to a female author, again, in Greek antiquity. Now, the fact that the writings are extant uh, immediately puts me in a much better position compared to other scholars working on uh, ancient Greek women philosophers. So my challenge is not one of so lack of sources. I do have texts to work with, but rather my challenge concerns the nature of the evidence. Um, so spe specifically, scholars have raised two objections to the writings ascribed to Pythagorean women. First of all, um, it is debated, so the text, as we will see, the texts are likely to be uh, spurious, to be written under pseudonyms. And therefore, it, this has led scholars to question the extent to which they could have been written by women rather than men under female pseudonyms. And then the second objection is that not everyone takes these texts to be philosophically valuable. So uh, for the purpose of this talk, I'm much more interested in problem in the second problem. So I will briefly mention the first one, but move on to, to the philosophical themes in the Pythagorean women texts and specifically predictions on wisdom. OK, so very briefly, again, as an introduction, uh, I just want to distinguish two stages in the history of Pythagoreanism. We have the early and the in the history of the Pythagorean women, we have the early Pythagorean communities on the one hand and the late Pythagoreans or pseudo-Pythagoreans on the others. So um, the um, early Pythagoreans, uh, the early Pythagorean communities were founded between the 6th and the 4th century BCE, primarily in southern Italy. And in these communities, we, uh, we have women, we have female members. And so the early Pythagorean women are students of Pythagoras or members of his family, such as his wife or his daughters. And we've already heard about his wife, Theano, uh, yesterday in Dorota Duch's talk. Um, the problem is that Pythagoras and the early Pythagoreans and the early Pythagorean women left no, with few exceptions, left no written works. So we don't have primary evidence from this group of thinkers. This changes in the Hellenistic period. So from the Hellenistic period on, uh, we see a flourishing of Pythagorean texts, of writings written under the names of Pythagorean philosophers. The corpus is large and heterogeneous. It covers a wide variety of topics. It was written over the course of almost four centuries from the second century BCE to the second century CE in different dialects. But the most puzzling feature of this corpus is that it includes, it, um, it has very few Pythagorean element. So there are, uh, there's no references, there are no references of doctrines traditionally connected to the Pythagorean tradition, such as the theory of reincarnation or number theory or um, some kind of way of life. But there are many more references to Plato and Aristotle and to Platonic and Aristotelian theories and arguments. So the suggestion, that's the, 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 the solution to this that scholars have proposed is that these texts are forgeries written in the Hellenistic period under the name of early Pythagorean philosophers with the aim of presenting Pythagoras as the sort of ultimate founder and source of influence of later philosophical traditions, Platonic and Aristotelian philosophical tradition. But for the purpose of this talk, what interests us of this corpus is that the Pythagorean pseudoepigrapha include texts that are ascribed to women. Um, here, I just gave you a list of texts. I, I I was trying to find uh, some like datings and classification scholars would normally agree with, but I'm not. I, I will not sort of say much about the dating today. So the corpus includes ten letters, uh, eight of which are ascribed to Theano, uh, Pythagoras' wife, and then one from Mia, uh, from Mia, Pythagoras' daughter, and one from Melissa. And then we have five treatises, which I divide into two groups. We have 
the ethical treatises, Periccione's on harmony and Fintis on moderation, that revolve around the question of what virtue is, what makes women virtuous. And then we have the theoretical treatises, which is what I'm interested in today. And these are on piety by Theano, uh, which uh, discusses the claim that um, numbers are the principles of all things. We have On Human Nature by Aizara on the tripartition of the soul. And then we have On Wisdom, which is the object of my talk today. Um, but once again, the, the issue here with these texts are twofold. So first of all, it is a point of controversy who the authors are and whether they are women. Uh, I just will say a few words about this because this is not the, the main um, concern today, my, my main concern in this talk. And then, most importantly, it is debated to what extent these texts count as philosophical. Now, thanks to Professor Wade, uh, recent scholarship has seen a revival of interest, of academic interest in the Pythagorean women. Uh, I want to distinguish, distinguish three trends, three ways of approaching the texts. Um, they are not chronological, so these are just different uh, approaches that scholars can take or have taken, and uh, nor do I want to side with one or the other. I just want to give you a bit of an overview. So the first trend is what I call the historical approach, which basically means taking the writings uh, ascribed to Pythagorean women as historical data, that among the Pythagoreans there were women and these women were doing philosophy. An example of this would be Sarah Pomeroy in her monograph on the Pythagorean women. We have what I call the skeptical approach for lack of a better term. Uh, and these are scholars such as Claudia Montepaone or Marguerite de Laurier, who have basically called attention to the difficulty of really retrieving reliable information about the Pythagorean women and assessing the philosophical value of their writings. So these are not scholars who questions that the text could have been by women, but they just raised, point out what the problems with these attributions might be. For example, according to Delorier, in Greek antiquity, the philosophical way of life was unsuitable for women who lacked a formal education and did not speak in public. And her suggestion is that these texts, therefore, must are more likely to have been written by men under female pseudonyms. Or again, she argues that in antiquity, men could choose to write under female pseudonyms, especially with the aim of educating female pupils. So the idea is that it is because these texts are sort of addressed to women or about women that they might have been written by men under female pseudonyms. Finally, again, in lack of a better term, I have the contextual approach. And so it seems to me that recently, um, in an ongoing attempt to do justice to women philosophers from the past, but with renewed attention to source issues, scholars have started to deviate from the question of the historicity of the Pythagorean women. So who the authors are, did they exist, are they women? But rather focus on the content of the writings and the, the contribution that they make to ancient Greek culture, rhetorics, literature, and philosophy. And an example of this is Dorota Ducci in her book, a uh, recent monograph of the Pythagorean women. So this is just to say that uh, there is almost unanimous consensus among the scholars that the Pythagorean women and the pseudoepigrapha deserves more and more thorough attention. And the question is, how should we approach them? And again, today I'm interested in approaching them as philosophers and just read the text, look for arguments. Um, right, so, let me just, so I, I'm just not going to say more about the pseudonymity questions. I do think that it is possible that these texts were written by women, but I am, I want to jump to, uh, on wisdom, to Periccione's on wisdom and look at what this text is about. So on wisdom is a metaphysical treatise ascribed to Periccione. And um, for those of you who don't know this, Periccione is the name of Plato's mother. So the question again is, is this an, a woman named after Plato's mother? Or is this a pseudonym, which again serves the purpose of connecting Pythagoras to Plato with a strong biological link? So Plato's mother was a Pythagorean woman. Um, we have two fragments from this treatise. Um, and in these two fragments, Periccione makes two key statements. First of all, she says that the purpose of a human being is the contemplation of the nature of all things. Second, 
she portrays wisdom as the highest ranked human activity because it enables us to grasp all kinds of things that are. So it's sort of encompassing. And it brings us closer, close to the divine. This claim is supported with uh, the introduction of a tripartition of theoretical sciences in which human wisdom and philosophy are placed at the very top. And I should stress that the, this tripartition is novel, is original. We do not find it in any other author. So that would be one of the contributions of Perictionis on wisdom. So I divide on wisdom into three sections, an introductory statement uh, concerning the purpose of human beings and the function of wisdom, and this is fragment one. And then I divide fragment two in fragment two A, which has a comparison between wisdom and other quantitative and qualitative sciences. And then fragment two B, which is the conclusion and has this concluding statement on the importance of attaining wisdom. Fragment one. First of all, Perizione writes, so she makes in fragment one, Perizione makes two statements. First of all, she says that the ultimate aim of a human being is the contemplation of the reason, the logos of nature as a whole. So humans are born and constituted for the purpose of contemplating. She then complements this with a function statement, a functionalist statement, in which she writes that the, the job, the function, the ergon in Greek of wisdom is to obtain such logos, to obtain such rationale and contemplate all the all that is, the things that are. Now, in the next fragment, Perictione elaborates on what it means for wisdom to be set over what is. The fragment is long and I will unpack it in a second, so don't worry about reading it now. So she, she elaborates on uh, what it means for wisdom to be set over what is into uh, steps. First of all, she distinguishes wisdom from other sciences with the help of an argument by analogy between wisdom and bodily senses. And then she organizes the sciences and their objects into three categories. So we have the three partition. The argument opens with a list of disciplines such as geometry, arithmetic, and other sciences, all of which focus on the things that are. Wisdom too, Perizione says, is set uh, upon what is, but differently from other sciences, it focuses on all the kinds of things that are. This is then supported uh, by comparing wisdom uh, to sight and hearing. So here we have an argument by analogy. Just as sight is set upon everything visible, so all things insofar as they can be seen, and hearing is set upon everything hearable, all things insofar as they can be heard, the object of wisdom is everything that exist, exists. Next, we move on to the tripartition. And again, we have two tripartitions. We have an ontological tripartitions of objects, of things, and an what I would say is an epistemological tripartition of sciences, so of ways of approaching and getting to know these objects. So first of all, Perizione distinguishes three groups of objects, those which pertain to all things, those which pertains to most things, and those which pertains to each one thing in a particular way. Next, she distinguishes three sciences and maps this epistemological tripartition onto the ontological tripartition of objects from the previous lines. Uh, and she writes, um, first of all, that wisdom contemplates what pertains to all things universally. Natural sciences contemplate what pertains to most things. And, this, and the last bit is a bit more puzzling, according to me. So the science concerning something determinate contemplates the particulars, what pertains to each thing individually. In the last lines, um, this tripartition is revised. Wisdom is said to investigate the principles of the things that are. Physics, the principles of what comes to be in accordance with nature. And the third group of sciences uh, inquire into principle of particular classes of beings, 
such as those with a magnitude or with a quantity in the case of numbers and mathematics, or those with a harmony in the case of music. So here the peculiarity. And the result is that wisdom is the highest form of learning. The conclusion, very briefly, is that wisdom enables humans to reach the truth and contemplate the God. So in Pericione's view, the value of philosophy is twofold. First, it makes one wise and true. Second, it enables the wise to behold what is divine and the like. Okay, so at this point, before wrapping up, uh, let me speculate for a second. The emphasis on, on wisdom, on, on wisdom is, uh, and the, the privileged positions that humans occupy qua rational beings, is the reason why treatises such as on wisdom have been interpreted as protreptic. The purpose of philosophical protreptics as a genre is to encourage audience to engage in philosophical activity. So the intellectual way of life is presented as the sole and the best way, uh, the best life worth living. Philosophical protreptics can be aimed at persuading students to join a specific school. So why should we become Platonists? Why should we become Pythagoreans? Or encouraging insiders to reach a higher level within the same doctrine. So how do we go from beginners Platonists to advanced Platonists? Or more generally from prompting non-specialists, non-philosophers to philosophize in the first place. It seems to me that Pericione's exhortations concerns philosophical activity in general. So the author generally describes the life of the mind as the ultimate human goal and the best way of living and reaching what is true and divine. On the other hand, this text may also be an exhortation prompting those who already devote themselves to the sciences and harmonics to pursue a higher a study of first principle and philosophize instead. But what I'm mostly interested in is who is Pericione addressing? Who are the readers she's prompting to pursue philosophy? Who is her audience? Does it include women? Now, one thing that uh, we should bear in mind is that while scholar may disagree on whether the authors of these texts are in fact women, no one agrees that women are the targets of some of these writings. So the letters are addressed to female interlocutors, some treatises are written up to teach women how to be virtuous. So this would be the case for Pericciones on wisdom too, the, the network in which the Pythagorean pseudoepigrapha circulate um, is likely to include women alongside men. Now, at first reading, Pericciones' treatise is not gender. She writes about humans in general, not women specifically and exclusively. However, Again, the, the, the group of thinkers and readers among whom the text circulates includes women. Uh, so Pericciana makes her case for philosophy as the highest form of living well. Uh, by exalting their intellectual power, she urges humans toward contemplation and impels young potential philosophers to philosophize. But again, this treatise is ascribed to a female author. So the author of Unwisdom presents herself as a woman, encouraging all humans, arguably men and women alike, to pursue philosophy. Since it belongs to all humans to be wise, women too, insofar as they are human, are made for the purpose of contemplation and possess wisdom. Riccione herself is presented as the sage mastering all sciences and living a philosophical way of life. So it's the best, high and highest form of life, according to Riccione. My speculation here is that the fact that the treatise is written in a female voice might have strengthened the gender neutrality of the argument. Having, sort of having a woman voicing the uh, exhortation welcomes women in the audience. And um, through Pericione's words, women enter a traditionally male discourse and gain equal share in metaphysics. So to conclude, what I hope to have shown is that the treatise attributed to Pythagorean women center on both uh, domestic matters, family life, and a, wide, a much wider variety of topics. The Pythagorean woman appears as both an expert on the household and a universal sage philosophizing about the principles and the functioning of the cosmos, human society, the soul, numbers, and harmonics. Specifically on wisdom, 
is one of the first metaphysical and epistemological treatises ascribed to female authors in antiquity, the ancient philosophical tradition, and the, the first, as far as I'm aware, in the ancient Greek philosophical tradition. And this makes Pericione, I believe, one of our philosophical foremothers.